and it looks as though we're live. Hey, everyone. Hugo here Hello. from Coiled. Hey, Matt from Coiled. And Lindsay from, as of right now, uh, UC Berkeley. Yes. Um, Hi, Lindsay. Welcome. Hey, Lindsay. Yeah. Hey, Hugo. So we're here to talk about uh, imaging Earth's subsurface with Python and Jupiter today. Can you tell us, tell us a bit about yourself and what we're here to talk about? Sure. Um, yeah, so my background is geophysics. I did a PhD looking mostly at electromagnetic methods. And so um, we use those in a variety of different settings, but it can be anything from uh, mineral exploration uh, to the example that I'll show a bit of today uh, with groundwater. And so trying to understand groundwater systems um, and potentially some places where we might need to, to intervene. Um, and so what that involves is a lot of numerical simulations, simulating, for example, Maxwell's equations uh, in electromagnetics. Um, we also want to do optimization and inversion. So actually try and estimate physical properties from, from those data. Um, and that, that's then what we use to actually interpret. And so that's involved a lot of um, sort of development of open source software. I work on a project called Simpen. Um, but also a lot of interactive computing. So we've played around a lot with Jupyter, um, IPy widgets, sort of how to explore your data interactively. Um, and so that's what got me connected with the uh, Jupyter team. And uh, now my postdoc at UC Berkeley is um, a lot to do with interactive computing in the geosciences, um, sort of connected both with the geophysics, which is my background, as well as the broader Pangeo ecosystem. Awesome. And I'd, I'd love everyone joining us to introduce themselves in the chat. Let us know um, what your interest is here, where you work or, or what you're up to and, and where you're tuning in from. Because where I'm in Australia, Matt's in uh, California. South California and Lindsay's in North California. Um, in Canada. Very oh, north. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, yeah. North, North, North California. Yeah, yeah. North Absolutely. California, yeah. yeah. Cool. Um, and But something that just sprung to mind, I, if I recall correctly, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, it was part of what took you to Berkeley was to work with, with the Jupiter people. Is that right? Yes, absolutely. Um, so got in touch with Fernando after um, some met at a conference and sort of we were talking about some of the interactive um, developments we've done with Jupiter, actually bringing simulations into undergraduate classrooms. Mm. And so we used Jupiter, I, I think we were starting this in like 20, um, about 2014. So like Jupiter Hub sort of was, uh, just starting to exist. Uh, we didn't have access to it yet. Yeah, exactly. And so we were having students install Anaconda and Jupiter on their own machines, which was uh, exciting to see. Mm. Um, but we use that basically as a way to actually have them um, basically be able to explore physics without having to actually code that up. Like coding wasn't at all a part of the course, but you could actually just use like IPy widgets using slide bars and, and toggle buttons and things like that to look at charges, fields, fluxes, um, all of that computation that we're doing under the hood. So. But of course, the computation requires a lot of compute, right? Um, so what, something, of course, I'm really excited about is that you're using Jupyter for interactive compute and Dask for, for big compute. Um, so it might be interesting to, as, as Matt's worked on, on Dask for so long, maybe, maybe Matt can tell us a, a bit about what Dask is. So you always ask me this question, I always defer it to the, the guest. Uh, so Lindsay, would you feel comfortable de de describing Dask? Are we describing Dask and Jupiter? Okay, well, I'll describe the slice of Dask that that I use because I think it's much bigger than um, than than what I've uh, had a lot of experience with. Um, but Dask has tools for uh, scalable and parallel computation, um, and so the pieces that I'll be focusing mostly on are uh, the use of Dask delay which allows you to basically set up computations, um, uh, like set up your whole pipeline, um, and then Dask will figure out for you basically how to, how to run that um, efficiently in parallel. And the other thing that I've been using quite extensively is Dask job queue. Um, and so because I've been running on uh, HPC centers, basically being able to write my notebook. Um, so Jupyter is uh, where I do a lot of my coding, which is an interactive computing environment. Um, and so you can combine text like in Markdown cells with code. Um, primarily I work in Python, but it can be any other language. There's kernels for I think over a hundred languages. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, you can connect to any of those, um, but I, I've been using Python. And so the interplay of those two, um, I think is really exciting is being able to actually interactively set up your computation 
um, and then define basically which pieces of the computation are expensive and then use Dask and Dask job to, uh, to take care of that for you. So. Fantastic. What I really like about Lindsay's work that is different from what a lot of other Python workloads look like, because she's, actually, she's doing a lot of simulation, a lot of computational workloads. A lot of what most people use Python for is a lot of data analysis. They've collected a lot of data or they've you know, run some simulation on some other system, and now they're going to sort of analyze that after the fact. Uh, Lindsay's work is different in that you're, you're running like hardcore numerical simulations, just a lot of them using you know, Dask HP systems to sort of pipe those together. And that puts it in like a slightly different category from a lot of the scientific work that we see. Yeah. And it's kind of, it's been fun sort of being a part of the Pangeo community and seeing such a wide variety of use cases. So for folks who don't know what the Pangeo community is, uh, it's a community effort in the geosciences to bring um, interactive computing technologies like Jupyter and Jupyter Hub, uh, deploy those next to big data sets on the cloud and or HPC centers so that you can actually do like large scale interactive geoscience computing. Um, and a lot of the use cases that I've been exposed to in that space uh, are very much more focused on the big data side of things. And so that's where things like Dask arrays are really useful, is that you smartly sort of chunk up your data and you can then interactively explore those data. Um, but yeah, our use case is much more on the very heavy computation side of things. The data set or the data sizes that we're working with are, are small compared to some of these like terabyte size and petabyte size um, data sets that folks work with in climate and ocean and uh, yeah. Awesome. So I'm really excited to jump in to, to the work uh, you've been doing, but we've talked around the idea of community and sense of community in both Jupiter and, and what took you to Berkeley and, and Pangeo. So I was just wondering if you could tell us a bit about the sense of community you've developed uh, uh, around this work and how that plays into your science and, and your practice. Yeah, I can maybe speak to that at a couple levels is because I've been involved in uh, an open source project called SimPEG. So for simulation and parameter estimation in geophysics. So fairly like scoped, tightly scoped around simulations and, and inversions and working with geophysical data. And so we started that project um, about 2013. Um, so a number of us at UBC, Rowan Cockett, Soggy Kang and myself uh, we're among sort of the first three um, enthusiasts in that group, uh, which has now grown to uh, a large, awesome group of people uh, you can check out on the contributors page. Um, but what was really exciting in that space is um, geophysics, uh, especially sort of geophysical imaging and inversion, um, has a strong sort of history of very proprietary codes is that, you know, in oil and gas, in mining, um, and even in some environmental applications, having the code was like viewed as a strategic advantage. But at this point in time, I mean, like Maxwell's equations are Maxwell's equations. We've, we've figured out how to solve them. And if you want to do something new or try and integrate with other data sets, that's really hard to do if all of the codes are behind, um, behind you know, proprietary walls. Um, and so this was a really exciting effort to sort of start to break down some of those barriers. Um, but I mean, and so that, that was one motivation is, is integrating, uh, integrating across different methods. But I think the other really exciting piece um, that's been a blast working with so many different people is that you really get to draw on so many different people's expertise is that no one person actually has to be the expert in like every single method that SimPEG has, right? We've got people who are experts in magnetics, some in gravity, some in electromagnetics, some in fluid flow. Um, and so we actually can combine all of this knowledge and be working together and exchanging ideas. And so seeing how like new developments in one space actually translate over to another uh, very quickly when you have sort of this, this open community of people who are invested in, in a common set of tools is pretty exciting. And so that's a smaller, uh, a, a small community. Um, it's sort of in, in a domain in the geosciences. And then I think what's fascinating is see, sort of seeing, being a part of uh, the Jupiter community and seeing, um, you know, a very, very large, very distributed community effort um, to be developing open source tools that really well, data science communities around the world rely on. Um, and so it's, it's been fun sort of being a part of, of these communities, seeing how when people come together uh, and bring their different expertise to the table, we can make some cool things. Awesome. Well, thank you for setting the scene there. And I, I, I think we should jump into to your work. I've shared the links to Pangeo and, and, and Simpeg in, in the chat. I love it that it's simpeg.xyz yeah. as well. <laughs> um, and any questions, please, please, please we, we, we encourage them and, and hope to get to them. But sh should we jump in, Lindsay? Do you want to share your screen? 
Sure, that sounds good. Um, perfect. Can you see that? We can. Okay. So I want to start by motivating this with uh, an example from Hugo's backyard. Um, and so this is a, a hydro um, a hydrology example um, in a region along the Murray River uh, in an area called Bukpranong. And so what had been observed to be happening is that the river here is getting more and more saline. Uh, there's a farming area here. Um, and so like uh, saline land is, is not a great place to be, uh, not great conditions to be growing things. And this whole Murray River irrigation area um, feeds a lot of uh, farmland around there. And so they wanted to try and understand, okay, what's, what's actually going on with the hydrologic system? Like, why is this river becoming more saline? Uh, and then from there actually plan some interventions of perhaps pumping in fresh water in strategically uh, important places. And so this is kind of the area that we'll look at. Um, and to give you a bit of uh, a picture here, so it's on a bit of a slope. So there's the, the uh, farmland is up here. Murray River is uh, down more in a valley. Um, and then there's two, the, the questions that they're really asking when we're trying to sort of track out along the river, um, there's sort of two overarching um, hydrologic uh, um, mechanisms where we can actually be having the water becoming more saline. And so one, we have what they call a losing stream. So if we have water that has that is somewhat saline, um, but then that water is seeping into the ground, we have more water um, leaving the river, uh, then what's left in this stream will be more saline because we're losing more of this fresh water. The other scenario, which is usually viewed as a healthy river, is when water is, uh, is flowing in. And so the, the water table is slightly above the river. But the challenge in this place is that because we have so much saline land around there, this is actually a bad scenario, is that um, it would be saline, like fertilized infused water that is recharging the stream. So the question is, is can we try and understand basically along this river, which areas are, are in, each, um, in each domain? And so what we're gonna use for that is actually electromagnetics um, because it's sensitive to variations in uh, electrical conductivity and so if you have something that's more saline, if you have more saline water, that's more conductive. If you have fresher water, it's, it's more resistive. Um, so the survey that we'll, we'll look at, there are a couple surveys flown, but we're gonna look at data from a system called uh, Resolve System. Uh, and so you can see there's a helicopter up here and there's this big boom that's hanging beneath it. Uh, and so there's a series of coils in this boom. There's transmitters where we're gonna pump a time varying current through there and that produces a time varying magnetic field. And then that interacts with the conductive earth inducing currents. And those currents produce their own magnetic field. And that's what we measure at the receiver. We do that a few different frequencies uh, and then we fly along the, the survey area. And so those, those are our data that we wanna work with. Um, but interpreting real and imaginary uh, uh, magnetic field values at a bunch of different frequencies is, is not an intuitive uh, thing to be working with. And so what we wanna do is actually take those data uh, and go through a process called inversion, where we're gonna try and estimate the electrical conductivity of the earth that's consistent with those data. And so I'll show you the results. Um, and so what, um, what these are showing is, is surveys that were taken in, at two different years. So this one was in 2006, this one was in 2008. And these are the data that we'll, we'll look at. Um, and so you can see the, the regions that are more red. Yes, we're using JET. I know there's gonna be Python people on there saying, why are you using JET? We did this specifically because there was uh, a paper that we compared to that was published a number of years ago that also used JET. <laughs> so, we'll forget it, I think. okay, thank you. <laughs> um, and so from this, what you can start to see is there's certain regions um, where we have the, this gaining stream scenario where this, this region up here is upslope uh, where that farmland is. And so this is actually saline water that's coming in. And then there's other regions here where we're actually losing, we're losing fresh water from the river. And so overall, we're getting a more saline river. And so eventually they used this to um, go in and um, sort of develop a strategic plan to figure out where should we potentially be drilling, um, drilling wells and injecting fresh water to help, uh, to help the hydrologic system. 
Awesome. And perhaps and I'm putting the cart slightly b before the horse here, but the basic I idea here is that there's a bunch of compute that goes into generating um, these results and these visualizations. And you want to be able to view them over a bunch of different, you know, hyperparameters, for, for example. And the combination of Jupyter and Dask allows you to do these in, in real time. Yeah, yeah. And so, um, because basically what we're doing is like, uh, I don't know if I have an image of the data. I think we should. Ah, we don't have the dots on there. I can show you the notebook. I'll, we'll reveal some of the some of the answers, then we can walk through this. So each of these dots, we've actually downsampled the data, mm -hmm. but each of these black dots is um, a single sounding location. And so we've got uh, five different frequencies, real and imaginary component. And so we want to fit the data for each of these single dots. Um, and so we'll treat this as a 1D problem. You can do 3D where you um, where we considered like a full 3D uh, mesh and run Maxwell's equations in three dimensions. That's a much more expensive uh, problem computationally. In this case, we'll, we'll treat it as 1D where you basically assume that um, beneath each sounding, we just have a layered earth. Mm. And so for every single one of these soundings, what we want to do is we need to be able to iteratively um, solve Maxwell's equations. So we basically start with a guess of what the conductivity is. We solve Maxwell's equations, see how well that fits with our observed data. Uh, and then we do an optimization to then basically try and have the data that we're predicting from that conductivity model match the data that we observe. Great. So that All involves right, well, Maxwell's equations a lot. <laughs> yeah. So let's jump in. Okay, so this is a demo that I put together this morning. So fingers crossed, <laughs> we'll, see, we'll see how it goes. Um, so I'm gonna uh, restart this and clear the output so we don't reveal the solutions as we My go. My favorite thing to do. Yes, uh, um, we'll see if I regret that. And and after the fact, everyone, we're, we'll, we'll share this notebook. Yes. Um, so actually a first thing, oh no, okay. A first thing to point out um, is you can Oh yeah, see, where are we? We actually are running this on uh, Cheyenne. So on the NCAR supercomputer. Um, so we'll actually go through the steps of how to log in and, and set that up. So- um, I didn't realize, of course it is, is Cheyenne, and act, uh, is NCAR, sorry. And we had we had someone from, from NCAR on, on, on recently. Um, yeah, so, so Deepak was our, our last guest. Uh, Deepak's an X-ray maintainer and also a product scientist at NCAR. He was using a, a slightly different cluster at NCAR. He was mm. using the Casper yeah. machine. Um, Casper is sort of has more memory. It's better for uh, data processing. Lindsay can do more processing. So using Cheyenne is more and more CPU focused. Mm -hmm. Yes, and um, this also, uh, what I'll hopefully do when I share these notebooks is also share uh, the setup for NERSC. Um, is that you can run the, the same ideas on NERSC. And what's pretty cool is the there's just one piece that you swap out and I'll point, point out where that is um, uh, once we get going. And so here, yeah, this is the Cheyenne supercomputer that we log into, this is the project account that I'm on. Um, and then we go ahead and we can launch that. And so we'll see this uh, hopefully spin up <laughs> so the demo gods are with us. Um, and so, um, yeah, and so there's a lot of folks in the Pangeo community that are on the, uh, that use Cheyenne um, because there's uh, a lot of the, or, um, so Joe Hammond and others who are at NCAR uh, were a really big part of sort of in initiating the, the Pangeo project. And so you'll see a lot of examples there. Cool, okay, I'm going to just close out these guys for now. All right. So we're back to our notebook um, and we can do uh, restart and clear out books. Okay. Okay, and so in here, once I, uh, when we upload this and share it, there's a link actually to EMGeosci, which is the website that I was showing that has a bunch of background on electromagnetic geophysics, if you're curious to see more. Let me make this just a touch bigger. Um, okay, so a couple things to point out just in terms of imports that might be particularly interesting to folks is um, Dask and IPy widgets. Um, and then the rest, this is all the sort of the SIMPEG geophysics uh, ecosystem. So we'll see, sometimes it takes a moment when you first run your imports. 
Um, and so we'll go ahead, we'll load up those, those data. Um, and then this is the plot that then we were just showing. So you can go through and we can look perhaps at, so we're just looking at the data right now. These are just the observed data. Um, we're looking at frequency domain data. So we have real and imaginary components and we wanna fit both of those. Uh, and then we've got a few different frequencies. And so the lower the frequency in general, the deeper we're seeing in the earth, the higher frequencies see shallower. And so that's how we get some um, uh, information about, uh, about depth. And so you can go through, take a look at these data. Um, and when you're familiar with them, there's, there's a lot of theory um, to support sort of which regions are conductive versus resistive, just kind of looking at these data. So as a first step, you kind of just QC and you know, see if there's anything that doesn't, um, you know, that, could you just give us some rules of thumb about that for like just reasoning about the real and imaginary parts and what, how you think about that? Yeah, so in general, when we introduce electromagnetic problems, it's much easier to think about uh, time domain. It's much easier to sort of think about a signal that decays in time. Mm -hmm. um, but in this case, because we've got basically a, a sine wave, um, we, we can split that up into real and imaginary components. Now, the, the signal that's transmitted is always a, a real component signal, but then because we actually have um, currents interacting with the conductive earth, that's where we get this imaginary component from. Um, and if you have basically, um, well, let's just talk about the, the real component. For something that is very resistive, the real component tends to be smaller. Um, as it gets more conductive, that real component will, will get larger. Sorry. Um, and then what, remind us how, how that relates to salinity? So in this case, um, the physical property that we're sensitive to is electrical conductivity. Mm. So that's, that's what we're sensitive to. And electrical conductivity is related to salinity because if you think about like salt water, um, mm. it's easier to pass a current through salt water than fresh water. And so mm -hmm. fresh water is resistive and salt water is conductive. Great. Cool. Okay, so then these are just a couple of parameters with respect to the survey. So this is how far apart the transmitter and receiver are in the in that boom that I showed. Um, I won't go into this into too much detail unless you are interested in sort of diving into the details. Um, mm -hmm. But what we're going to do here is actually basically set up the machinery to run a simulation. So all of this code, we define a mesh, which is like our 3D discretization of the world for the single sounding. We're just going to consider one sounding at a time. Um, we set up basically what our receivers are, what our sources are. Um, and then we have the concept of a simulation. So this object can go ahead and actually compute uh, data given a model of the Earth. Um, we can come so is back. Is this some sort of like, is this related to like finite element methods or? Yeah, this is a finite volume, but you can okay. use yeah, finite elements. So some sort of um, way to solve PDEs. Great. Yeah. And I, I know nothing about, I mean, things, di long distant ancient thoughts are coming back, but. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then this is something we can come back to you and, and chat about if that's of interest, um, because one of the things that we've run into as a challenge is um, some of the codes that we interface to, like numerical solvers, are actually written in lower level languages and have their own parallelization. And so you have to be kind of thoughtful when you're using that with Dask. Um, it's very easy to get very confusing results. Um, so we've learned a lot of lessons around that. Great. Um, okay, so anyways, this, this gives us the ability to predict fields. So we can, um, or yeah, given a model of the earth, we can now simulate data. That's what we've done up to here. Um, and then the rest of this is actually setting up an optimization problem is because what we want to do is try and estimate that conductivity model um, given predicted or given observed. Mm -hmm. data. And so we have some uncertainties associated with the data and such that we, that we incorporate into the definition of our, of our optimization problem. So if we stitch that together, what I'm going to show you first is just like, let's just pick one of those single soundings. So a single location on the map, and we're just going to try and estimate a 1D uh, model of the Earth. And in fact, we're going to use, I think it's this, this data point here. Um, so we just pick one, one data uh, or one location. 
And we'll go ahead and run in version just so you can kind of see what that looks like. So that spot was in a green area, which in my mind means that it is conductive and so probably salty. Yes. Um, and so in this case, uh, which frequency are we looking at? Yeah, that's relatively near surface. So if you remember, this part is sort of upslope. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're going from the farmland now down to, down to where the river is. And so, yes, we sort of expect to get something conductive uh, in, this, in this area. Okay, so what we just did here, I can actually maybe rerun this if you want to see, but anyways, we um, this is what it takes to run an inversion. I'll run that again, just so you can see how quickly that goes. So it's an iterative process. We're using um, like a, a gradient descent style approach. We use second order optimization for this, whereas you know machine learning, um, it's mostly first order optimization. Um, and then what we're trying to do is reduce this value of phi d until we hit some target misfit. So phi d is basically our measure of how well are we fitting the data. Phi m is then some sort of regularization to try and get us back a, a smooth model. Um, and so this one converged relatively quickly. Um, we can go ahead and actually look at the data fit. And so we can see our observed and predicted data. Um, we've defined error bars on each of those. I didn't, I didn't plot those, but we can see overall if we kind of look at the general setup and we want to go in and maybe try a few different hyperparameters. This is a good way to do that is just focusing on a, on a single sounding because you want to sort of spend some time um, looking at all of these parameters that we tune, for example, like beta, like your noise levels, all of that sort of stuff. That looks like a pretty good fit to me, knowing nothing about this. Yeah. Um, and so you can drive it even closer if you uh, if you want to, but then there are um, there's noise that comes in because we're flying around uh, in a helicopter. There's going to be shaking and things like that. So you know you in general don't want to exactly fit your data, um, but this is a good check that basically the parameters that I've chosen are at least reasonable for for a single sounding. Yeah, and that was going to be my next question. How do you how do you think about overfitting? I know how this would work in a machine learning context, but not necessarily here. Yeah, so we've actually put out um, a couple tutorials sort of on inversion um, and can, that go into that in a bit of detail. But cool. basically what happens is it's easy to introduce much more complex structure than what is actually there. So if you try and really, really fit your data, you're going to try and introduce basically a lot of conductivity structure to make that happen. So you're going to get a complex model out. And the danger in that is that you can then, if you hand that to a geologist or a hydrologist, um, it's very easy for somebody, as it makes sense, if you see all of, uh, if you see a complex model, to interpret complex geology when that's not necessarily supported in the data. Great. Cool. So that's our data fit. And then what did we actually get back? Is then a uh, conductivity model of the subsurface. So this is depth. Sorry, I should label my axes. Um, and then here you can see very near the surface, it's fairly resistive. But then what as exactly what Matt was uh, seeing in, in those data is that we then actually have a relatively conductive unit sort of near the surface. Um, and then that goes back to um, our, our initial and reference model because we don't necessarily have um, sensitivity to see very, very deep. And so a lot of once you start getting very deep um, is controlled by, by your initial guess. But here we can see some interesting structure in the, in the near surface. So now we want to do that a thousand times. So this is where Dask uh, comes into play. And so here we're using uh, Dask job queue um, to give us a cluster. So we're going to request nodes now from Cheyenne. Um, so here, uh, each of these uh, each request here that I set up is a single, we're going to get a single node that's got 109 um, gigs of memory. And so wow. then you want to distribute basically how many, um, how many computations or how many CPU, how many cores you access on there um, based on how, how much memory each one is going to take. And could either Lindsay or Matt just give us the, the rundown on what DAS job queue, job queue is? Go for it, Matt. Sure. I also want you to like press that cell so we, we don't get yeah. stuck in for too long. <laughs> While we're talking about it, let's at least get, get through the queue. Yes. Um, 
yeah, so Lindsay, prior to Dash Job Queue, you probably were, were launching things on supercomputers with batch job scripts. Mm -hmm. You had a little like script that would say, you know, run this program for two hours on this kind of machine. Uh, and most people with HPC backgrounds are familiar with that kind of script. Uh, Dask job queue is using that same mechanism, but to deploy like a, a live interactive Dask cluster. So we're sort of hijacking a bit of the cluster. We're sort of taking a piece of it for ourselves uh, to then connect up to our Jupyter notebook. So we're gonna now kind of sort of operate with a, a, a bunch of machines, but all interactively. And that's, that's quite, uh, it's handy. Um, so Lindsay has just connected her Jupyter notebook to 12 machines or 10 machines, it looks like each with 12 cores. And now she can sort of play on that, on that interactive slice of the supercomputer. Small historical note, a Dask job actually came out of the Pangeo project and we were, the first cluster was run on was Cheyenne. So this is the, uh, it's coming back home right now. This is the OG. Yeah. Great. So if you can bring up the workers tab, Lindsay, and I'm actually fun just so people can see the, the machines that we're connected to. So you can see all the addresses there and uh, we're now connected to you know, a bunch of different machines, a bunch of different processors. Then we can control all those machines, which is fun. Yeah, and then so what's kind of cool here is then to actually like set this up. All that I'm doing is taking that function that I had written before, wrapping it in Dask delayed and just writing my for loop as I want to do this for all my soundings. Um, and so as Matt mentioned, you know, normally you would have to actually basically take the notebook that I had written, turn that into a Python script that then actually, um, and, and rewrite some of that so that it makes sense to submit as a batch job. Whereas this, I just write sort of my naive for loop um, that would actually run in serial uh, if we didn't use Dask. And so we'll go ahead. Would you mind just minimizing the left-hand panel, the Dask? Yes. Yeah, that'd be great. Perfect. Okay, um, so now we're gonna run lots of inversions. Maybe. <laughs> there we go. So we can start to see some things happening. Great. And so previously we did it for one point. Now we're doing it over the entire uh, region. Yeah. And how are you distributing those different points across? I guess we want to see the profile. Sorry, I just wanted to pull sure. it right. No, this is great to see how people's work, see your workflow. Um, yes. So previously we ran, wait, sorry. We want to see the task stream, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's the satisfying. Oh yeah. That always feels good. Um, so we were just- Particularly on an HPC as well. Yeah. Yeah. So we were looking at um, just one, one inversion before. So it took a, a few iterations. Um, mm -hmm. So now we're actually just running and cranking through that whole survey. And you can see it chugging along um, and our our CPUs are busy. Um, and so one, one point that, you know, I mentioned with the solver, one thing that might be interesting to, to folks that we had to, there's a couple of things that we had to do. Um, first of all, for a problem like this with that solver that has its own sort of parallelization, we ended up, you have to set the cores uh, and processes to be the same in a lot of um, other, uh, parallel jobs that you would use Dask for, you don't necessarily need to do that. Cool. Notice you also had set uh, MKLDs one thread way up in the top of your computation. Yes. Yeah, so with those two things, then, then we're in good shape um, and we can go ahead and actually um, grab our, our uh, results. So that's our model and our predicted and observed data um, and we can plot those up. Oh no. Oh, it's just my title. We'll ignore that. Just the title, that's okay. We have a long history of failed demos on Science Thursday, so. Well, that's good. <laughs> One 
while you're doing that. Oh, oh there we go. No need to riff. Never mind. <laughs> um, yeah, okay. So then what we're looking at is I've picked just a single frequency. So um, this should be the 400 hertz. Um, so that lowest frequency. And we can look at our observed and our predicted. Uh, they're both on the same color scale. And so you see overall, we're looking at very similar patterns. And so just kind of a QC of, of my inversion result overall, we see, you know, these regions, um, we have larger uh, values. These are, are um, stronger negatives. Um, and so, yeah, overall, like the sort of the visual match is pretty good. I mean, in general, I would also go and sort of plot the difference, look at percent difference, all of these sorts of things to QC my results. Um, once once it's done and potentially actually go and, you know, make some updates to to the hyperparameters we use in our setup and rerun this. Um, but the real thing we want to see then is now uh, this result. And now actually in Veritas, for, for those of you who were unhappy with uh, our jet plots. Um, and so you can see we're getting back um, some of these similar features to what we saw in that uh, in that original figure where we've got a much more conductive region uh, in here, we can see these resistive regions uh, sort of more downslope and, and um, northern area. So uh, kind of cool is that we can actually go ahead and reproduce uh, a lot of what was shown in, in that other, um, uh, in that intro. Fantastic. So we, we have a question which I'm just just answering. Um, it's about all the all the notebook widgets, such as workers' task screens. Are they specific to what we're doing here, or are they common on all Jupyter hubs? And um, the answer is, of course, that <clears throat> they're they're all Jupyter Lab extensions that have been built by Dask and Bokeh and J Jupyter people. Is, it, is that correct? Yeah, it's, it's all connected within, I think it was actually at a, one of the Pangeo meetings. Matt, you can correct me if I'm wrong on that, but um, Ian Rose and others got together and I think at least maybe started the initial uh, hack at a Pangeo meeting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Ian Rose, I think is also a geo something or other, a geophysicist, geo yeah. something? Yeah. Geologist, who knows? A geophysicist turned data scientist. Turned Jupiter lab developer. Yes. Oh, great. This is, this is fantastic. So what I'd, what I'd like to, to know a bit more about is how, how you would have thought about this or reasoned about th this type of work had you not had access to Dask and or, or, or Jupiter and what your, because we were able to do this all in real time right now, right? Yeah. And explore using in, interact and widgets and, and that type of stuff. Um, yeah, I mean, so for me, so much of, um, initial work on sort of exploratory science questions. I mean, so much of where you spend time is actually like plots like this. I can't tell you how many hours uh, of my PhD were spent looking at simulation results and sort of flicking back and forth between different frequencies or different times or something like that and just trying to understand what I was looking at. Um, and so I think there's there's so much that goes into needing compute, but looking at it interactively, spending time getting to know your data uh, and understand your data. Um, and what I think is so exciting about being able to do this in Jupyter connected with Dask on HPC or on the cloud is that I can go ahead and I can prototype, like this is just I, the way that this that I would approach this in, in writing it is I would actually be iteratively setting up like each where each of these headings are. I would probably actually have that, you know, not in a function um, and just go ahead, set up each of these pieces, look at them, make sure that I, I did something reasonable, um, maybe check the sizes of a few things and things like that. Um, so you sort of prototype that. Then we say, okay, I've got all the pieces in place. Let's now make it a function. And so this is, this is very much a function that is like fit for purpose for this research. This is not going into a library, like I've hard coded things. Um, this is fit for purpose for this problem. Um, but we've got now a piece that we can reuse for like for each sounding in this problem. Um, I go ahead, I tune my parameters and things like that with a, a fairly lightweight computation, but it still takes time. Um, and so you go ahead and if I had set uncertainties wrong, or actually you'll notice in here, there's things like we, um, uh, we have higher uncertainty on the highest frequencies and things like that. And that those decisions you only make when you actually have time 
to go ahead, iterate, like run this inversion is, is one we probably on this collaborative um, project. So the original work here, I should mention, um, is courtesy of Soggy Kang, who set up this uh, inversion and he's at Stanford uh, these days. Um, and so, you know, set, setting this up, you'd spend time um, basically just looking at these, these couple of plots, uh, choosing your hyperparameters, tuning them. And then what's so exciting about using Dask is now I just say, okay, now I just need to actually scale exactly what I just did. Um, and I don't want to spend time rewriting, rewriting all of that um, into, you know, a, a bash script and, and a Python uh, script that I then lose that interactivity and I lose the connection between sort of my original thought process and then the larger scaled up version. What I love about all of this is that you, you said you, you were starting working this demo like this morning. Yeah. This is very much like an interactive workflow for you. You're able to sort of explore stuff, put something together, operate at scale, get out some nice results, give a talk on those results. Um, what if you wanted to extend this uh, to make it something that ran all the time or to engage students or to engage other folks? Do you have thoughts on where to go from here? Like what's, what's your next step? If you want to take this work and apply it more broadly, what would you do next? So that's where, I'd, like, I think um, widgets uh, have a really cool role to play and notebooks that have um, a bit more documentation. And of course, because I hacked this together this morning, I, I, I at least put in titles, but there's really no description of what's going on at each stage. Um, but one of the things or one of the projects that I've been involved in um, that I think is quite exciting is basically using notebooks like this um, and we had a humanitarian project um, with folks in Myanmar. So they were looking for groundwater with very similar methods, uh, simpler, not being flown from a helicopter, but actually plugging electrodes into the ground and measuring voltages. So they go out and collect all of these data. Um, and then we basically set up notebooks that interweave code um, and widgets so that folks can sort of interactively explore some of this setup. So instead of perhaps running, uh, you know, running these as two independent steps, maybe I have actually just got a couple widgets where you choose those hyperparameters. We give you a bit of guidance. We give you bounds on those because there's bounds of, um, you know, what what makes sense and what doesn't, um, and giving you sort of that that easier way to interact um, with with the data and with the computation, um, and then still sort of having having the ability to actually scale that up. Um, so yeah, I think widgets, uh, widgets are a piece I'm really excited about for engaging with broader communities. And the other thing I'm hearing with respect to, you know, these combinations of widgets, interactive compute and, and, and distributed compute is essentially one way of thinking about what you do is you're doing a bunch of simulations or experiments and your HPC or your cluster is, is your lab of sorts, right? And this is, this is your environment. And, and previously, I mean, I used to work in, in, in biology, right? Where experimentalists would run their experiments overnight and then have to come back the next morning and their flow would be broken up yeah. completely, right? Whereas in this situation, because of the nature of the interactive compute combined with the, dig uh, the distributed compute, you're able to almost do it in, in, in real time yourself and stay in, stay in that flow with your, your research. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. And even, I mean, even for some of the, the examples that we'll take overnight to run, because this is a nice 1D example. If we actually were gonna run this in 3D, it would take uh, a couple hours at least. Mm. Um, it's still like in context of your thought process. So I still was, you know, I was able to run this scaled up version in, in context with my workflow is that, you know, I worked through chose parameters um, and then we could go ahead and actually just, just scale that up. And so even yeah. if this did take time to, to chug along, um, it's still all connected with your original thought process and your workflow. And then you can interact with the results um, when you get them back because we're still sort of in this interactive uh, Jupyter environment. And, and something we haven't tackled ex or discussed explicitly here is, is the role of laziness. Um, so is, when you're using Interact, is it, is it only doing the compute when, when necessary in, in this particular case? So in this case, the interact that I have is um, uh, pretty straightforward as we were just basically plotting up the data. And so we didn't need to, to use laziness. Right. Um, but in general, if you wanna be hooking up and connecting um, 
interactive widgets to a larger simulation or to an inversion that is iterative, um, absolutely, that is something you need to be you need to be doing is waiting until waiting until they've made you know selections to actually go ahead and, and update things. Great. So there's a question in the chat from Moriana. Uh, can you use these tools with, I'm going to mispronounce this, but Pi Gimli? OK, uh, so Pi Gimli is one of the other um, geophysical simulation and inversion packages. Uh, it's more focused, I believe, on, on finite element approaches. And yes, absolutely. Um, it's all in the same open ecosystem. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's something you could definitely deploy. And now, I don't know about their parallelization strategy. And so I, I, I don't know enough to say, like, you know, connecting it with Dask, how that would work. Um, but if you want to sort of be doing interactive computing in Jupyter with widgets, it's, it's all sort of a part of the same ecosystem. So we're going to try something slightly different today. We're going to wrap up slightly early and, and go to a place. I'm going to put a URL uh, in, in the chat. Um, and we're going to, it's a, we'd like to speak with you all um, and just, just have a chat uh, about what, what you found interesting, what you're up to. It's, a, it's something called Gather Town, where we walk around as a animated characters. Um, and essentially, it's like, like a, a virtual meetup. Um, and you interact with the people who you are with in, in the space. So I'm going to put that link in here. And we're going to wrap up now. Um, but then uh, if, if you'd like to join us here, it, it'd be great, great to see you there. Um, I, I do have one last question for Lindsay. Um, and, that question is around next steps for people who may not have been exposed to uh, this type of stuff previously, but if they want to explore more, what, 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 what can they check out? Yeah, I mean, there's some, so there's some great resources out there. Um, the Dask documentation has uh, a bunch of great examples um, and the do's and don'ts is one of my favorite pages uh, on, on there of how to efficiently and effectively use Dask. Um, the Pangeo Gallery has some great examples um, and there's a whole suite of examples, anything from uh, climate to remote sensing uh, to uh, oceanography. So that's, that's a great place to look. Um, and then as a part of the Jupiter Meets the Earth project that's um, funding a lot of the work that um, I'm doing currently at UC Berkeley um, and that uh, is sort of our, it's a project that's joint with folks at NCAR to continue sort of building upon a lot of the ideas um, that have been really started with uh, Pangeo and Jupiter of developing technology in partnership um, and in conjunction with scientific research. And so that there's a positive feedback between both um, research and, and tech development. So as a part of that, we've put out a couple of blog posts. Um, and one of the things that we're, we've had a call uh, or a number of people have, have asked for is really a collection of, of resources for getting up and running with Python, for getting up and running with things like widgets. Um, and so that is something to, to watch for. We, we haven't started that, uh, started that yet, but there's a number of tutorials out there um, that we're gonna work on trying to, to collect and, and we'll post a resource at some point in time around that. But for now, definitely check out the Pangeo Gallery, um, IPy widgets, and there's some tutorials that we put out on widgets and interact. Um, so if you if you have a look on YouTube, there were some at some of the recent hack weeks. Um, so that's that's a few resources. And I'm sure Matt, do you have other favorites in the Dask uh, Pangeo space? No, I think the, the Pangeo gallery is probably the great right, 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 probably the right place to start. And I've just linked to several of those, including the the Pangeo gallery in the chat. So. Um, Thank you once again, Lindsay. This has been such a fun session and it's always great to chat. Uh, thank you, Matt, um, as well. And thank you all for joining and we'll see you in, in, in Gathertown. It'd be great if you could put your, I think Gathertown asks you to put your name in at some point uh, as opposed to being, being anonymous. So that, that would be cool. Uh, but we'll, we'll see you there. Um, and thanks 